ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to North Shore Live Cooper's Corner. We're live this evening. This is May the 10th, uh, 2017, and it's raining out. Uh, when you will see this, uh, I hope the weather will be uh, uh, more pleasant for you. All I know is that uh, th this is most uh, strange weather that we're getting. Uh, frost the other day and a little bit of snow and now more rain. So uh, please watch yourself. Be careful. Uh, all I can say is that summer will soon be upon us without all of these distractions. People are not uh, accustomed to driving in this type of weather. Roads are slippery. Please be very careful. We're here and we're here for your safety. Please be very careful and be watchful of other cars. Do not travel faster than the speed limit, specifically with weather conditions being the way they are. Anyway, hope you had a good day. The weather just turned like a couple of hours ago this afternoon. So uh, it was uh, uh, it was sunshiny this morning. It was nice. Um, uh, as our guest this evening, we have uh, Ken Dukowski at, with us, and we're really happy to have him with. You know, we never uh, explained uh, to you, the viewers, uh, uh, the prominent cases uh, that uh, Ken has had. And so uh, for about the first half hour, we're going to talk about uh, uh, two cases or maybe more that we get time with because the second half will be for uh, regarding other cases is uh, those who may have not been alive at the time or you have been or you were young um, but uh, the Skokie Nazis uh, so uh, Mr. Dukowski <laughs> was the attorney uh, mm. uh, defending their uh, their right to um, uh, demonstrate I wasn't defending the Nazis. Oh, he wasn't defending that. We're, we're going to get to that. And also, that was in Cook County. And Larry Eiler, uh, it was a very large case here in Lake County. And uh, Mr. Dukowski was uh, one of his attorneys. So, uh, ears up. And uh, uh, this is the gentleman that uh, participated in those uh, two cases in particular. There are more. But... We just thought for your information, since you really didn't know that he uh, was a participant in those cases, you'd like to know a little bit more about them. I do have the book um, uh, that was written um, um, about the Larry Eiler case. And, uh, but let's go to uh, Mr. Dukowski first and uh, welcome him. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. And that really mm -hmm. ought to perk somebody's ears up. Mm -hmm. uh, so which one do you want to start on, the well, Skokie we can, Nazis? Or? We can start out with the Skokie Nazis. Okay. I did not represent them. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, I had a, <clears throat> a major problem with them. When I first started practice, I was placed, I became secretary of the Rug Cleaners Association. And they got me memberships in every organization on the planet. <laughs> Good news. And in fact, the postman thought I was schizophrenic. Oh my! I got uh, stuff from the from the Nazi Party. I got liberal stuff. All political. Uh, I got political stuff up to the zoo. Paperwork. Wow! And I moved my office to Rogers Park, and I picked up a bunch of clients who were businessmen who would escape from the concentration camps. And first these men went to Israel and then they came here and they started businesses. And <coughs> many were successful. I had I had one client who uh, was in the Polish underground. He wasn't Jewish. And the Immigration and naturalization would not let him in the country because of his activities in the Polish underground. They found that that the Polish underground uh, treated the Nazis almost as badly as the Nazis were treating everybody else. 
and they did some horrendous things to the Nazis, and these men were singled out. Anyway, he came here and he got himself a job as a as a um, hairdresser. And it wasn't long before he bought the salon and the building and the building next to it and the building next to that. And he was uh, making a good living. Uh, well, these these people who came here had immigrant vigor in spades. Mm. No grass grew under. They were busy under their legs. Yeah. They were aggressive, honest, and straightforward, and really, really nice, nice people. <clears throat> and then we heard <clears throat> that the American Nazi Party had decided to march in Skokie, and they had a First Amendment right to do it. There was, and every court ruled that they had a First Amendment right. The only problem was my clients and many other people did not want, did not want to allow that to occur. They realized that in Nazi Germany, a small group of people grew into a major group mm -hmm. who took over the entire government and ultimately threatened the, the world the world, yeah. And my clients were not going to allow it to occur. And they decided the plan to kill Nazis. And the whole group of lawyers were set up to defend them because these people had no, there's nothing you could talk to them. I said, I suggested, please, don't interfere with them. Let them come. Let them march. There are only seven or eight of them. And they'll march to empty streets. That's as big a humiliation as you get. Empty, yeah. And my, my Polish client said, well, there are only seven of them. I could take all seven. <laughs> he says, I'm not letting them march. I don't care if there's no one on the street. And a couple of the businessmen said, that goes for us too. So we were caught in a dilemma. And fortunately, the authorities in Skokie felt like I did. To let them march? Uh, well, no, they, they put every obstacle in their possible. Yeah. And they forced them to go to court, and finally the Illinois Supreme Court, in a blistering opinion, pointed out the fact that we do have a constitution here, we have a constitution in Illinois, and you have an absolute right of free speech. And the fact that you're going to offend people and you're going to bring them to violence doesn't interfere with your, your right of free speech. It is absolute. If I want to come out in favor of X, Y, and Z, and you agree with me, we can go march in downtown Highland Park or downtown Chicago or wherever we want, and no one can stop us. If it's a large enough group, we have to have permits and we have to have bonds and things of this kind, but those are not real impediments. We can, we can do it, okay. and we can express our opinion on anything we want. And the same is true for people who oppose us, who have diametrically opposed views and who have views that are totally obnoxious. So that's where, that's where we stood. And the fight went, the fight went on. Uh, ultimately, after the Nazis won, they had a sense of reality, and they decided not to march. So the march never... But in the Blues Brothers, the picture... <laughs> well, that was someplace else. <laughs> that that yeah. was, they, they uh, Dan Aykroyd absolutely said that, the, uh, that Illinois has Nazis. We have the Illinois Nazis. Mm -hmm. They were in Skokie, they tried mm -hmm. getting through. That was the Cebu, the picture. No, we had but Nazis. They were there. 
the American Nazi Party had tremendous, tremendous appeal during World War II, unfortunately. They'd, their bones were, I think it was Western and Lawrence, they raised money openly. They did a great deal and then they kind of died out and then an American, then a group came in and these were, these were losers. Uh, one of them was a fellow named Cohn <coughs> and he used to send me letters and propaganda. For the Nazi party? For the Nazi party. My goodness. And then I get the solicitation notes, and I like the solicitation notes because they had, they had an envelope, a paid envelope. Paid envelope. So I went to the fishing store, and I bought fishing weights. And I stuffed everything I could possibly could in there, plus a fishing weight. Sinkers. And sent it back. So. <laughs> and this went on for about, it went on for, for several years. You're joking, really? Oh yeah, they they kept on. The uh, the Skokie thing wasn't the only problem. One of the judges uh, offended offended uh, the American Nazi Party, and they issued a death threat against him. And the assistant corporation counsel called me and said. The judge would like to talk to you and would like to discuss the, the dealing with them. And we discussed it and we realized there's not much, much we could do. We couldn't prove it came from, from them. But we knew where it, we did know it came Same, from them. Yeah. So we decided that we would take some extrajudicial actions. And they happen to be in the city of Chicago, and you know the city of Chicago is a city that, that works. Well. And it just so happened that the building inspector who happened to be assigned to that area went and inspected the building. Where their office was. That's correct. Okay. And decided that the building ought to be condemned. So the city of Chicago sent out a summons and a notice that unless the building met the city building code, it would be, it would be demolished. Well, the owner of the building came in screaming and hollering. What's go <laughs> That's right, so. And it didn't take him long to discover that the problem wasn't so much the dangerous condition of the building, it was a dangerous condition of his tenants. The tenant who was in there, yeah. And they were eliminated. They were asked to leave. And they were, they did leave. A, an, an order of assistance was entered by the judge. And they left. How long did it take? Did they try to fight it or did they when they were given that to leave, they did leave? Well, or? this was an emergency <coughs> matter because of the health and safety of the public was necessary. Okay. And in order to do the repairs on the building, did we had to vacate it. So an order of vacation yeah. occurred. And then they asked for help in getting out the tenants. So the sheriff was directed there to remove them. They moved into a building and the same thing happened. Okay. And they ultimately moved out of the city of Chicago, and where did they put uh, roots down? Anywhere? I think I, if I recall, it was Park Forest. Park Forest, true. Oh. And uh, they dis they then disappeared from the judge's life, yeah. and I got these this garbage. And uh, I went to Senator Percy at the time and asked him if for some way I could get help in um, stopping this salacious literature that was being sent to me. It really, it really got annoying. Well, and they're using uh, the U.S. government. This is a federal 
it's, uh, still, to, for, it's to, still First Amendment. To deliver mm -hmm. some of this terrible trash, yes. okay. And my partner and I sat down to draft some legislation, and we drafted it, and the senator put Great. it out, mm -hmm. and the Jewish organizations came in screaming and hollering that we were interfering with the First Amendment. Oh. <laughs> and we never got any further, See? but ultimately they left us they left us alone. And by not marching in Skokie, they they saved an, a lot of problems that would have would have occurred because sure? these people who came out of the concentration camp had no tolerance for for Nazis one way or another. And uh there are several other incidents that I'm, I wouldn't mention publicly that, that did occur, including uh, one of the concentration camp commanders ran into one of his inmates. Oh, my goodness. And uh, the inmate gave the commander a speedy road to his maker. Uh, but what you're saying is they never did march. Did they even mm. hold uh, a meeting there in Skokie? No, they uh, stayed away. In any of the, the had parks? They, had Skokie they come parks? in? Had they come into Skokie? Yeah. Because I know I remember that mm. the streets, the highways, were mm. blocked off. Mm. Uh, um, you know, 41 mm. uh, was blocked off. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, get on mm. any of the, uh, you know, the the, the drives off so had they come to Skokie I'm sure there would have been a mass murder I'm sure and uh, there's no there was no way that we would allow not we but my clients would, would have allow them these to, people yeah. were you there at leeway. the time were you with them or were you uh, somebody yeah. must have been in the park the Skokie or Oakton Park or they something? were I stayed I stayed away yeah I didn't want to encourage them any further than... No, they, you didn't need any encouragement. And yeah. every one of my clients was armed and fully prepared to dispatch any Nazi who showed his face to his maker. And do you think that they were told not to come? Or by whose recommendation was it that they not show up? Probably their own. Really? Because it wasn't, it was pretty well known that there was going to be violence. The police were trying to talk to individuals. The, the Skokie Police Department was out, was out there doing yeoman's work, trying to protect the citizens of Skokie sure, the from themselves. Sure. Because it would have been murder. Yeah. It was premeditated. It was intentional. Yeah. And the fact that, that years before, People wearing the same bands or acting the same manner and sprouting the same slogans had done some inhuman things was an excuse. Yeah. We have absolute free speech. If I want to go out and sing Nazi songs and, and say Nazi slogans, I got an absolute right to do it. No one can stop me. Free speech. Theoretically. As yeah. you know, as you know, asking for an honest investigation uh, oh, <laughs> is not is, no. is not appropriate in I Illinois. Wonder, I wonder where Larkin was at that time. I you can you can say Nazi slogans, yeah. but you can't ask for an honest investigation. No, can't be. What, so yeah. then, what transpired after that? It just died down, or it, it just died. It, it died. It slowed down. Uh, they wanted the publicity. Sure, well, and the Chicago Tribune, big headlines, you know, uh, uh, Nazis to march on Skokie and stuff like that, yeah. yeah everyone, everyone wanted to see something happen. Happen, sure. And fortunately nothing, nothing did, and it's just a, a memory and one of those situations where <clears throat> where I have to hang my head in shame because I, I did not defend the First Amendment. In fact, uh, the First Amendment was the last 
was the last thing I was concerned about. And that, yeah. and this is part of the, this is part of life in, in a city like Chicago. And that brings us a little bit to Larry Eiler case. Larry Eiler, holy mm -hmm. moly. And Larry what Eiler. What a hot number that was. Larry Eiler came to me from a man by the name of Dobrovalskis. Dobrovalskis was one of my clients in the cigarette tax cases. Cigarette tax cases were the cases where the state of Illinois, in conjunction with the outfit, stopped Illinois citizens from buying cigarettes that they purchased in Indiana. I don't understand. They still have the seal on it, don't they? The Indiana, Indiana's tax was about a quarter or a tenth of the Illinois tax. Oh, no wonder. And the reason I mentioned in conjunction with the outfit was subsequently the Internal Revenue Service discovered that the plant that, that that manufactured the cigarettes stamps, yeah. sold half their stamps to the state of Illinois and the other half to, to the outfit. Oh, oh my goodness. And okay. so that the Indiana people were competing with the outfit for, for cigarettes. Sure. And the net effect, net effect was the outfit complained to the Illinois Department of Revenue, who then went and stop people coming from Indiana, confiscated their cars on the spot, and left them standard, uh, stranded. And uh, one Labor Day weekend, oh, hot, Labor miserable Day. weekend, oh. they had a whole bunch of people. Sure, they're and going over, uh, across state lines to buy the cigarettes and come back. Well, they're coming home. Uh, one night, a representative of the family, and they crossed the Illinois border, yeah. well, they, they got in on Indianapolis Boulevard, they stopped and saw cheap cigarettes, and they bought some. They bought four or five cartons of them. And they crossed the border, they're stopped by Barney Fife and the other oh, Illinois Mayberry, Department oh. of Revenue oh. people. <laughs> and they took the car, they took the cigarettes and left them stranded. Oh my. This is a, this is a family of, uh, this is a family of uh, husband, wife, and two children, and the little girl was a baby, and they just left them there. Well, my client happened to be a Tribune employee, and I was hired to represent, represent them, and it started a ten-year case that went. Oh twice to the Illinois Supreme Court before it was fixed twice. But uh, out of that case came Larry Eiler. And, and Larry Eiler, Dovowskis, his son, uh, had a relationship with Larry Eiler. And Larry Eiler had, had been driving down to his home in Indianapolis when he found that nature called. He stopped the car and went to relieve himself. When he came back, he found the police arrested him. <coughs> and at that time, they proceeded to hold him hold him overnight, and they proceeded <coughs> to raid his home. Why did they, why did they do that? They suspected that he had killed 20-some 20, 20 people. Men, boys. Yeah. Okay. And... Uh, that was his, uh, you know, his, uh, not his calling, but he was uh, ill that way. Uh, well, in actuality, he had, but I didn't. I did not know that, uh. and nobody told me it initially, and lo and behold, wound up, wound up getting the car released, and then the Lake County Sheriff over here picked him up, 
and arrested him for killing some kid in Lake County. Uh, it was Lake Forest, and his car was uh, left uh, on the uh, tollway on 294. It was a little beetle bug, and they did no, find... No, it was a... He had a, he had a uh, pickup truck. A oh, pickup truck. And he had what distinguishes... He had big tires on the back and little tires on the front. Hmm. And at the scene of, of the killing, in the sand was some vehicle that had big tires on the back and little, and little tires, tires on the front. Okay. And together with some materials they had found in his home in Indianapolis, they proceeded to arrest him. But they took their, they took their time and they did all kinds of things in connection with it. And we filed a civil rights suit because they wouldn't give back the car. So you were then hired by the father uh, of well, this young man. Well, I was hired by, by Larry Eiler and his parents. Oh. Uh, and I filed this civil rights suit to get back the car, okay. and they were making all these allegations of him. Did his parents know about his strange behavior, his, you know? Um, they said no. Yeah. And the only one who believed him apparently was me. I, I bought his story hook, line, line and, and sinker. sinker. Yep. And when they start making these allegations, the police have a tendency to build up, build up their case in the press. Okay. And by the time the defendant gets to court, he's already tarred. And everybody knows he did it. So not doing much in the way of criminal cases. I asked Larry, did you do it? He said, no. And just fortuitously, Rick Rosenthal at Channel 9 okay. called me and asked me if anything was new and said, I hear you're taking the either case. I said, I am. He says, can I talk to Tyler? And I thought a minute and said, why not? You can. He believed him. You can, inter you can interview him. As a matter of fact, let's make it credible. I won't even be in the room. I'll stand by the door. But I don't want you to show his face. And you can ask him any question you want. The interview went absolutely fantastic. How long was it? It was a good 15, 20 minutes. And sure enough, CBS called. They said, can we do that too? I said, why not? So Larry sat through, same thing, same procedure, and had a beautiful interview. NBC called. I said, okay. ABC called, and I said, no. <laughs> Why I said no, I don't, I don't know. That's the lady who wrote the book, by the way. Uh, yeah. And she autographed the book for me. I have it home. <laughs> I should have brought it, but. <laughs> she did a sequel also. Oh, did she? Mm -hmm. I don't own a shark skin suit. Oh, a shark skin suit. <laughs> and I don't do traffic cases. But, but she wrote the book. Larry was indicted, brought before the court. I went to court with him. And after the court proceedings, the sheriff said he would like to uh, have a press conference. And the judge when the judge heard about it, he said, would you like to do a press conference too? I said, sure. We'll have Larry do a press conference. Now this is before Danny Bridges, right? Yes. Okay. So the sheriff gives his press conference and the press asked him all sorts of questions. I'm sitting, I'm sitting right with the press. I'm keeping quiet. 
and he describes a who the killer is. And I don't know what hit me, but I whispered to the sweet young thing sitting next to me. I think he described himself. Really? <laughs> the description the description was um, someone having homosexual tendencies, overweight, slightly overweight. Yeah. Um, it seemed to me like he had described, described himself. himself. I said that, and she started to laugh and whispered to somebody else. And the press conference ended like this. Wow. So then we had our press conference. And Larry performed very well for about five, ten minutes. And then said, I'd like to stop. So we stopped, and that was the, the end of it. And I was told that the state was going to seek the death penalty. And I had never handled a murder case before. I certainly wasn't going to cut my teeth on a death penalty case. Mm -hmm. So I called Dave Shippers. And Dave agreed to represent Larry. Dave talked to Larry five minutes and whispered to me, he did it. Uh. And I said, no, he didn't. Oh. Uh. Look, at the, look at these tapes. He says, yeah, I'd, if I only looked at those tapes, I would say no. But I think he did it. So we looked into it and we discovered that there were two, two patterns in each death. There were 20-some deaths, 23 or 24 deaths. All young men. All, All young men. men. <clears throat> and there seemed to be two patterns. And I suggested we look into it. And then some kid was released from jail. And there were no more deaths occurring. And of course, I was looking for anything I possibly could at that particular point. Uh, one, to get Larry off, and second, to vindicate my. Oh, <laughs> well, to make a long story short, we discovered that an anomaly had occurred. When Larry was stopped in Indiana, the police radioed to the state police in. In Annapolis, and since Larry was not going to be available, they could make a raid on his apartment. So they did. And they took all kinds of things out, some things that they thought was incriminating. On the way out, one of the coppers says to the other, did you pick up a warrant? They hadn't. So we presented this to Judge Black who dismissed, who barred him from using any evidence they'd gotten from the Indianapolis raid. And the case was over. That part of the case was over. Shortly afterwards, Larry told Dave. Shippers that having me as an attorney was too stressful. I can understand it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he had a lie he had a lie before three television stations at a press conference. He could be a Chicago politician. Uh, easy. He did, a, yeah. he did a beautiful job. If you, oh. if you can get copies of it, oh. it was marvelous. With the case over, Judy and I went on vacation. And we were staying at a Holiday Inn in Thunder Bay, Ontario. And I get a call from Rick Rosenthal. He says, you're going to defend Larry Eiler again? Uh-oh. What is it? I said, again? does he need any defense? And he says, yeah, mm -hmm. we caught him. He was caught killing Danny somebody or other. Danny Bridges, 16-year-old boy. A runaway. Yeah, yeah, and he was uh, 
he was seen dumping the body in a dumpster, and he had cut the body up in a... Cut him up uh, in pieces. In the bathtub. Yep, in the bathtub, arms, legs, head, mm -hmm. everything, cut him up. And I was upset. Well, really, really. Upset. Yeah. <laughs> are you going to believe this one, or are you going to hook well, line and sinker this I, well, one too? No, this time, this time I knew. It was, okay, it was it. you got him released. Yeah. And uh, was it? Was it? It was Lake County Judge Block, not Black. A Judge Block. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Judge Block. Uh, he passed away, and the son passed away. Uh, everyone really connected with this case. Has, uh, well, learned. it's a long time ago. I'm 80 years old. I know, but you know, <laughs> this was headline news for a long time, and uh, in incredibly so to the fact that you know you really uh, should have explained to the viewers that how he, you know, had his uh, how he was able to capture his uh, victims is he gave them cold beer. Uh, well, and many of the victims were, uh, were male prostitutes. Male prostitutes. And yeah. uh, he picked them up along the street or the highway, wherever, mm -hmm. gave them cold beer, but put uh, sleeping tablets or whatever mm -hmm. in there. Well, he had a, he had a uh, companion with him, a professor at Indiana State University. University. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure exactly how, the, how they did. I think the professor probably killed half of them. And the other, that's the reason there were, there were two. Two, yeah. There were two that were involved in it, and the police were kind of frustrated. So, uh, pick up where you left off here. Uh, I wouldn't be able to take a drink of water. I'm, I, I'm waiting here for, <laughs> for every word you say. <laughs> so, when uh, um, Channel 9 News called you and said, are you going to defend him again, you didn't have any inkling of what had happened? I had no idea. I had no idea. It was, it was out of the blue. And I got a call from one of my clients who was with the Chicago police who told me that this was not, this was a case I should stay far away from. Yeah. And I was very upset and I didn't sleep that night. And uh, my wife drove, drove the car when we left the Holiday Inn and I must have fallen asleep the minute the car we're driving down a dirt road. It's a ninety mile. It's ninety miles from from the highway to Armstrong, Ontario. And she's screaming at me. That that semi trailer truck is on my tail. And I look. Oh I look back, and there's this big truck. Wow. And we're on a dirt road. And I said, "Where we're we going?" She's going to Armstrong. We're going into the into the brush. Mm -hmm. And she took me. She took me fishing. We flew in near the uh, Albany River, and we fished for a couple of days. I, I and that was the end of that was end of Larry Eiler until until this attorney picked up and decided his civil rights were violated, and she was suing somebody. And I got subpoenaed to testify, as did one of the court one of the. Uh, Newspaper reporters, the one who wrote the book actually was the one. And that's where I, I met her mm -hmm. and discovered that she was the one that I had turned down on the interview. Oh. And uh, I hear that that courtroom in Lake County was packed to the rafters. Everybody was there. All the news media was there. It was incredible. There were a lot of people there. Incredible. But I didn't notice anybody except the judge and my client. Yeah. And when the state's attorney says that he was going to ask for the death penalty, I've never had a black cloud flow over me so fast. But fortunately, Dave, Dave Shippers took Took Dave case over. took the case. And, and uh, where was it finally heard? Was it ba still back, back here in Lake County? Well, or? we never got out. Of, we never got out of motions. Okay. Because the once, once the judge had had uh, quashed the evidence gotten out of Annapolis, there was no case. 
for instance, the if you look at the um, Commonwealth Edison tires on their trucks, they got skinny tires in front and big tires mm -hmm. in the back. So it could have been a Commonwealth Edison tire. And with these criminal cases, the proof has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Did he not confess to it? Not until long after, long afterwards. Apparently something happened with his male lover mm. and both of them confessed to it. And the professor from Indiana University? He was the he was, he was the, his lover. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was a wild. And I said, I remember saying to my husband, I mean, we didn't know you then. We mm. didn't know. Mm -hmm. I said, look at all this information. Look at what, everything that we're going through. Look at, you know, a piece, you know, every piece fit, every piece of the puzzle fit. Mm -hmm. I mean, who would be an attorney for this person? It was incredible. And I remember seeing the video where he was walking out of the jail, uh, of Lake County yeah, Jail. Yeah, everyone, everyone has seen it. My wife laughs at it every time she says, she looks at me and says, why are you? Why are you patting a, homo, a homosexual on his gluteus maximus? See, look at <laughs> Incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, the, uh, the information mm -hmm. that was given, and there, were, there was a family out of uh, Lake Forest that mm -hmm. did lose a son and didn't know where he was until they did mm -hmm. find uh, his remains. But this was long afterwards where it was just skeletal. It could have been uh, hidden in the forest preserve uh, out of uh, Lake County uh, for a, a year or two years. And they finally found um, he was coming back from uh, school in the East, Harvard or Princeton or Yale or one of them, a very well, wonderful family. And they uh, found uh, their, their son, this was the remains that was left uh, un, you know, recognizable because it was skeletal. Yeah. They had to use uh, dental records, but the, the parents hadn't heard from them. They were waiting for the summer. He was going to come home for the summer, and uh, this is what transpired. It was really horrific, yeah. really, really horrific. Uh, innocent people taken up by the fact that they may have had a flat tire, they needed help, uh, that they were, he was going to give them, you know, a ride to the... Most of them weren't innocent. You know, Most of them were male prostitutes, right. or they picked them up at, they picked them up at homosexual bars yeah. all over the, all over the Midwest. And uh, it's a, it's a different world it is out, a, out there. Oh, yeah. And the world of how the um, homosexual is a lot different in the world here. It's Most of them are quiet, nice people, but you have a violent group. You know, uh, it's like um, uh, John Wayne Gacy, what his... Uh, true. And he, he murdered those, uh, those young boys and buried them uh, in his basement, in mm -hmm. his crawl space, and where they come up with... Uh, 25 or 32 bodies. Uh, they eventually uh, had to demolish the house. And, um, uh, well, they're still finding bodies. They're still finding There's bodies. There's some guy, and I got a call from a policeman in Daytona Beach who called and says, why don't you come down here with a list of, with a list of the people your client's supposed to kill. Uh, we, have a, we have a serial killer who's confessing to everything. Really? Really? And I said, "What? You know, most of them are t aren't true." He says, "Yeah, but it's cleaning cases up." Wow. And this this guy was confessing to every every case they put in front of him. Yeah. I can't think of his name right now, but this is a different this different world, and I'm glad I stayed away from it. It's uh, the lifestyle is different. Uh, definitely, the people are different. And well, the, uh, the whole criminal the whole criminal justice system is is a serious problem oh, because of absolutely. the fact that, first of all, <clears throat> you hear time and time again, guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. 
What does that mean? Can I have any doubt? The answer sh should be no. Yeah. But it's still, you still run across certain of these, these situations where people are, are brought before the court and you find out years later, DNA the shows DNA. they weren't involved. And having this as an attorney losing cases, every attorney loses cases. No one has ever won every case, unless he's a total liar. Mm. But to lose a case where someone loses their life, or lose a case where you have a long-term situation, really hurts and it hurts the family and you get you get involved with the family of, of all these people you represent and you want to do the best for them and what happens they're guilty you take that that um, Seth Gilman Seth Gilman here's a guy who has everything in front of him he just he just happens to be an individual who preys on the elderly and their families. What makes him any different than someone who takes a gun and shoots and kills no, someone? No different, but it, when you're his defense attorney, the first thing you do is you look for something good in him, something you can like. If you hate the person that you're representing, right. you're not going to do a very good job for him. You got to find something, some redeemable. Does every attorney, even if he knows that his client is guilty and has caused chaos and turmoil and tragedy, does that attorney try to get him off? Yes. You try and do the best you possibly can. The state has the obligation to prove their case each element beyond a reasonable doubt. And the purpose of a criminal attorney is to make sure the state does exactly that. If you, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about these guardianship cases. We, we should really get to, uh, the, I, I'd like to get to the, the judge that was only a judge for 142 days. We're going to get there. We're, yeah. going, we're going to get there. And to make, do it, it. make a transition, though. Yeah, how do we do this? Uh, this my favorite statute right now happens to be 755 ILCS 5-11A-3. That's the guardianship statute because this is where the seat of corruption is in my life because one, I'm getting up in the years, and second of all, I asked for an honest investigation, and they, they took my license because I asked for that. And then they lied. They lied terribly in the, about the Mary Sykes case. Case, yeah. And this statute says, if you, I'm just going to read you part of it. it. says, but only if it has been demonstrated by clear and convincing evidence that the person is a person with a disability as defined in <coughs> section 11A-2. That's the person, the guardian. A guardian cannot be appointed unless, unless that person has that. Yeah. they've been demonstrated by clear and convincing evidence the person is a person with a disability and this complies with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then it goes on to say in paragraph B, guardianship shall be utilized only as is necessary to promote the well-being of the person <coughs> with a disability, to protect him from neglect, exploitation, or abuse, and encourage development of his maximum self-reliance and independence. <clears throat> guardianship shall be only ordered to the extent 
necessitated by the individual's actual mental, physical, and adaptive limitations. So we have, like in the criminal case, yeah. we have limitations. Now, this limitation is clear and convincing evidence. And why is this important? It's important because it affects the civil liberties. It also affects the Medicare payments that have been made, the Medicaid payments be made, <clears throat> and every federal program of aid. And if you look at 18 U.S.C. 371, that's a conspiracy statute. And it says that any person who joins with another to violate a federal statute <coughs> is guilty of a crime. Now, each one of these individuals that has been guardianized wrongfully, <coughs> Mary Sykes, Alice Gore, mm -hmm. Carolyn Wyman, oh, right. each one of these people The, the guardianship of them created by its nature a violation of a federal, a federal crime. Civil rights were violated. They used the mails. Mail fraud was violated. Mail fraud, yeah. And these Medicare statutes were violated. So with this type of a situation, we have We have every person involved, from the cover-up to the performance, guilty of the crime and jointly and severally liable, civilly as well as criminally. <clears throat> that means when Mr. Larkin, knowing that Mary Sykes had never been served with proper summons, family had never been notified, there was no hearing. And listen, here you're even saying that that was illegal when, when in uh, Indianapolis they took, uh, without a warrant, you know, materials mm -hmm. out of uh, uh, Larry uh, Eiler's house. They couldn't go forward because uh, they did not receive a warrant that gave them the uh, authority to be able to go into his house mm -hmm. to secure that information. Exactly. So look at that. Uh, you have a, That's you have a crime a, and this is a crime. But this is a federal crime. Every aspect of this thing has parallel federal statutes. That brings in 371. Is that because they're senior citizens? The no. The ADA? No. no. Well, it is, it is because you're eligible for Medicare. Okay. Now, in Mary Sykes' case, <clears throat> They received the Medicare, mm -hmm. and they also used the mails to obtain her insurance. Yes, the insurance. So they had a double, they had double coverage. Yeah, double, yeah. And they created a situation where she needed more Medicare. So when you get down to this, you come up, you come up to this. Now the the question always has come up: Why is the judge involved with this? And we, the Chicago Sun-Times apparently has uh, decided to teach us something about civics. And there are a whole bunch of articles that, come out of, that have come out of the Sun-Times in the past May 4th, May 4th, May 5th. These are all recent because May. They're all recent May, ones. May 10th, that's absolutely correct. We have a judge uh, rushing the trial in federal court. It's a judge who committed some federal crimes. And then we have Judge Cook. And there's the Sometimes article there, too. Uh, Judge Cook has a very interesting situation. <sighs> Judge Cook lives, I think it's in River Forest, and he wanted to become a judge 
in Cook County. Well, he lives in Cook County. But River Forest, you've got competition. So he moved down to an area in Chicago. I think it's Logan Square. And he made a deal to become a judge. And to make this deal, he had to pay some money. And he paid a little over $100,000. It says so in the article. Got paperwork on it, okay, mm, black yeah. and white. I, oh, we have I have one, my glasses. We have one minute to go. Can you get this in in one minute? Because we're going to have to do then a follow-up show on okay. this. Okay. So anyway, they put him. They he put this hundred thousand dollars in, and they must have asked him for something else. So he wound up, he wound up in the. Uh, he wound up in marriage court. He didn't want marriage court. Well, he he refused to go to traffic court. <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, so they put him in marriage yeah. court. And the the significance of this thing is the fact that John Cash had an article Cash. about how to become yeah. a judge yeah. and you had to put $50,000 in a gym bag and give yeah. the Democratic yeah. committeeman. Well, we found out in the Judge Cook case exactly how that works. And it's not $50,000, it's $100,000. It says, why Cook County judge quit after only 142 days That's correct. of being a judge. And he went back to his... Uh, his old uh, well he's going he's going back yeah but in cook county they're not as uh oh that's our music. they're not as forgiving <laughs> uh, listen uh, we need to tell our viewers that you can see this on youtube and there is the address of our youtube uh, and you can see this program and other programs on my youtube uh, dot com north shore live uh, Cooper's Corner, and uh, you can visit other programs that we have had on there. We're going to have Ken Dukowski on again to go through that folder that he has, and we appreciate you watching the program, um, and we appreciate Ken for coming this evening. Thank you so You're much. You're certainly welcome. You're always welcome to come. We're going to do a part two of this. I'm interested to know your folder. An hour seems to be 30 minutes. It just disappeared. <laughs> So thank you for allowing us in your home and your place of business. Have a very uh, pleasant evening, a very safe week. Happy Mother's Day. Mother's Day, May 14th, this coming Sunday. Please remember your mother, your aunt, your sister, and anyone you hold dear and love. Thank you for watching. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you.